Patrol One to headquarters. What do you got in that bag? 280. Prime Accord, plastic, check charge. No, 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 man. I mean something that's not lethal. Everything's lethal. <laughs> <laughs> Just tired, Mike. Say I was a moviegoer. I was a drama student. And re cut it piece by piece in terms of visual impact rather than the standard MGM bullshit. I make pictures for myself and hope that I'm part of the audience. I didn't write it to shock the audience. I wrote it as something that I would pay money to see. I enjoy doing nonviolent pictures. Certainly Cable Hogue, which I think is possibly one of my best pictures. It is a disturbing film, uh, subconsciously as well as... Uh, I mean, it has a lot of little lines and themes going through it. To do one picture with Steve, you must be a little bit crazy. To do two, you must be absolutely mad. All my guts, all my life, everything I am is up in that screen. It's, it's all there. It's right there. Everything I feel, everything I am is there. And suddenly, you wake up in 1975 and realize you're 50 years old. 300 of your closest friends show up to pay their respects. But in Hollywood, there's no film in sight. Neither the studios nor the public are much interested in Sam Peckinpah. And for good reason. Alfredo Garcia didn't cost much, but didn't make much either. So Sam desperately needs a commercial success. Marty Baum, who also produced Garcia, has another project. Marty Baum was uh, great, a great gentleman, and um, uh, Helmut Dantin, the associate producer, was great too. They were great people, and some liked them very much. 8 a.m., Susan Bay, 35 miles north and east of San Francisco, row on row of deactivated victory ships, the Mothball Fleet. 8.05 a.m., actor James Kahn steps onto the U.S. Maritime Services dock at Susan Bay. The anchored ships once took part in two vast military and naval actions for America. Today, their use will be for a different kind of action, as a movie set for a sequence in a new film starring Kahn. He'll work with Robert Duvall, Arthur Hill, Gig Young, and Bo Hopkins. He did send me the script then. Uh, right away and said, I don't know what you what you can do with this part, but do something with it if you want to play it. So I did. And that was fun. I got to work with Jimmy Kahn and of course, you know, uh, uh, I, I didn't get to play tennis, but with uh, Bobby Duvall, but I got, to, I got to shoot him, which was, but it was fun. It was a good cast and it was a, a um, gosh, we shot in Chinatown. I love that. I'm great for lunch every day. You have not a good food. ABC camera, Mark. Give me, please. Cut. You can relax for about 10, 15 minutes and we'll be back into it, please. He 
he said, look, do something with this character. I don't know what, don't care, just do it. So then I, I read it, and of course it was like radar and mass, little guy. So I got glasses and tried to make it cool, and that way I had five pair of glasses, and I'm nearsighted anyway, so it worked out. I got five pair of new glasses, so that was fun. I don't think your company hired me. They got me tapped as a psycho. Well, they just don't understand you, Miller. Now, you're not a psycho, you're, um, you're the uh, patron poet of the manic depressives. This shot, this stuff goes off. I wait till it goes off. I come out. The moment of shooting draws near. Cinematographer Phil Lathrop puts finishing touches on the lighting. I said, go on. I'm not going. Khan plays an agent hired to protect a foreign dignitary. To do the role, he had to learn new and strenuous physical techniques. We're at the window. Uh, I'll win a few, lose a few. You'll pay for it, right? We'll take care of it. Uh, listen, I'll pay a buck to the first guy that gets my cane back. Hey, dude, thank you. <laughs> I worked with Mr. Khan in Hollywood before we came up. We had Hank Hamilton and Tack Kubota. And Jimmy came into the studio for about three weeks, and we worked with him daily. And then we had some time at his home private. And he became very good and very proficient with this cane that he uses in the picture. The thing he's using is a walking stick because he's been shot in the leg and the arm. He's making a comeback, so he has to overcome this handicap. And while he's uh, overcoming his handicap, he has to learn to use something that'll be a good use to him in the picture. So we use a cane that he makes the same passes with his hands as a karate man does with his hands, only he does it with a cane. He can learn what they call a kata or, or a routine in such short time because he is very fast. Khan is easy on the set. He helps keep everybody loose before the cameras roll in the tense scene coming up. A square knot? Yeah. You know when I tie the two hind legs yeah. together, they have to put a square knot on. Yeah. Perfect square knot. And it just go like this. Are your fingers tied? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What are you, Wyatt Earp? I got something better if you want it. Oh, that's fine. Old weapon. Slow rate of fire. Heavy. Hard to aim. All the, the people that he knew he could count on to bring a character alive. That he didn't have to worry about the acting. He could concentrate on what he wanted to look like. And that's what I would do if I was directing. Maybe it would be better to wait here until the real police come. Look, I don't give a damn what you want. If you want to stay alive, you get in the cab. Go on, move it! Layla! Here we go! I thought I told you to get out of here! I'm not going! Silifant wrote the screenplay, and one of the conditions of him writing the screenplay was that his wife could play the lead, and Jimmy Khan hated her, and Sam didn't like her either, and you know it was, it was not, it was not a happy situation. I'm a virgin. Well, 
Well, that's, uh, that's very nice. I really don't have time for your confessions right now. Look, kid. I don't want this to sound too harsh, but to tell you the truth, I really don't give a shit, all right? We were all sitting in on the camera car, and Bert Young and Jimmy Kahn and Tiana were in the car, and they were all mic'd, ready to go, except that she didn't realize that everybody on the camera truck could hear what she was saying pre-shoot. And everybody on the crew heard her say, having, working on films is being happy is having to be nice to people you no normally wouldn't shit on. And everybody on the crew heard it. And from then on, you know, her life was miserable. In other words, she was, you know, she was saying that the crew people were sort of beneath her. And really, she wouldn't talk to them if she didn't have to. So it, it, she, she created a bad atmosphere on the set, unfortunately. Well, I uh, thought you kissed the business off. Why'd you buy a buggy like this? You know, uh, maybe I appreciate a good machine. What I used to, I used to think what I did was nice and necessary, you know? What the hell do I know? If an actor had his thing and it was right, um, he, he liked that. But sometimes, you know, I never heard him, uh, I never heard him put down an actor or make an actor feel so uncomfortable, which he did anyway with him because he, he mama like this. He talked worse than I did. Huh? Yeah, that's all I know. That. So you'd have to lean in real close to hear what he was saying. He did that on purpose because he wanted you to pay attention. You like stewardesses? <laughs> Sometimes. I tried never to do anything or add anything unless I talked, you know, I, uh, I showed it to him in the scene. You know, I didn't go over and tell him. I just said, I'm going to do something. I want you to watch. And, uh, and he, if he liked it, he'd keep it. He said, no, let's do it again. We tried to kill him this time. Well, we're not quite sure about that yet, except it's something off the Far East circuit. We've had word that Negato Popo may be in the country. Well, who in the hell is he? Godfather of all the ninja assassins. But he's never been outside Japan as far as I know. Well, if he is here, you can understand it's either for compelling personal reasons or he's been paid a lot of yen. The point is, we do know that young Chung is here. We've got to keep him alive until he connects. He hired every single kung fu and martial art artist that he could find in L.A., which was unfortunate because they all conflicted. And they were all different methods and different styles. And it just, it, 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 it lacked cohesion, you know? And it was just, it was, the whole film was a mess. Don't like it at all. Nah, I don't like it either. Mac, cut it to starboard. I got it, Mike. Ready to dock. I'm afraid that the ship was about four feet above the water after we left because we because it was we were shooting on the mothball fleet and most of the the, the crew took all the sort of the the, the brass <laughs> they could find. I mean, the, the, there was some stuff taken off that boat. I can assure you because there were some beautiful fitments that nobody cared about because those boats were going to go you know into, into the into the mothballs anyway. So we a lot of stuff disappeared. I think. Moving out of your position. Twirl it, twist it, flop it over, and bring it back, catch the little horns very cleanly. I want to go for 32 one time. <laughs> 32 <laughs> one time? Yeah. One time for 32. Yeah, I want to go for 32 one time. Got him. Jimmy was, you know, very high speed, you know, and sort of Sam was always trying to catch up. But they got on. And Bert and he became good friends. Right here? You like that? Boom, I take one step. Boom, Bert is over there already. And that's his. All right, here we go. 
and gentlemen, here we go. Second final mark, would you go here? Yes. Victor Ray, please. To this point, Khan has done a pretty good job of protecting his client. To film it, the company has consumed 4,500 rounds of blank ammunition, 30 crates of vegetables, and four automobiles. Stuntmen have plummeted off buildings, over trucks, and off piers. And no one's been hurt. Yet. Clear cameras here, please. Now they work to pin down the action once more. This is what Sam Peckinpah does best. Fired and action, please. He has Khan go through it again and again until they're both satisfied. Peckinpah narrows the arena. As in all his movies, the conflict will be resolved man to man. Hold it. This movie will be no exception. What's the matter with you people? Don't you listen? I told you to sit tight on it, didn't I? Now! I hear. It's all over. Forget it. He's going to the SFPD. Forget it. Let it be here now. Or it will be elsewhere. How's that gonna save your people you standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with this monkey, huh? Look, we didn't go through what we went through the last three days to stand here and watch you get killed. Look, go ahead, get him. You're mad, come on. These actors are experts at kendo, the oriental art of fighting with swords. The weapons are real, the edges are sharp. that you would be following Bert down his route today. You got a big day, Jimmy. Oh, a lot of stuff. One night we were all drinking, and, and this is back in when. And I said, I want to know why the hell it is, and in all your movies, I get killed. And he stopped, and he said, You know, damn it, you're right. He said, I'm going to try to fix that. So we shot for another week, and we were on that, all those ships, and so it came to the climatic part, and then Con and Bert walking down to the boat. Well, he come and got me and said, uh, stay bloody, go get on the boat, and when they walk on the boat, you know, just surprise them. So I said, okay, because I thought it was going to be like a throwaway thing. So when Bert and Jimmy were doing their lines, I walked out, and they, what the hell are you doing here? What? What? And they looking around, and I said, hey, uh, I, I run out of bullets, and besides, I don't know none of that kung fu shit. Holy mackerel. They picked me up and they were going to throw me overboard. Well, I was a freeze frame. And of course, uh, uh, United Artists cut it out. But he was going to use that, which was funny. I mean, it's a different kind of ending. I see. That's a pretty funny thing, and It's a pretty nice thing. I think people took it too seriously at the beginning. The Killer Elite makes its money back, but isn't a big hit.
All filmmakers want the same thing. They all want to create. They want to tell a story, want to direct their actors, and want to get an image on film they already have in their minds. It's a job without security. Therefore, a filmmaker needs success in order to keep working. But for some filmmakers, even success doesn't guarantee getting work. Most filmmakers want to tell a story they care deeply about, and they're willing to fight for their films with all their power and accept all the risks that entails. He came to my house because they sent a uh, guy had brought over a CIA. Uh, he said he was in the CIA, and of course he had this script, so I called Sam, and, and he came to the house, and, and we looked over at the synopsis, and he said, look, uh, first of all, uh, if I, have you got any money? Because if I have to write this thing, that's going to cost you more money. And he said, oh, yeah, no sweat. I can get the money. He said, well, prove it. You prove to me you got the money, I'll write this script and we'll do it. Well, of course, he came up with the money, but, it, but I wanted him to, because I wanted him to direct. This is just before he did the last movie. Awesome. Yeah, Osman Weekend. And I was hoping we could do it because, you know, he and I wanted to work together, and plus I wanted to get him working again. He was winning the Golden Boot Award. Yeah, and I drove him, and he used coke in the car, and I just, I couldn't believe it. I, th I was, I thought, ah, oh. and um, he didn't drink at all then. <laughs> of course, then he could say, I don't touch alcohol, but he did use coke. And that was the summer before he died. I'm certain the coke contributed to his death with a heart muscle, weakening of the heart muscle. He could drink all day long. He didn't get drunk because for some reason Sam had this sixth sense of more creative, you know, whatever. It didn't bother him. Whereas with me, I'd be, all right, okay. <laughs> Never saw him that way. Only in a bar, yes, but not on the set. Never saw him fall down drunk. Uh, but when, when the other stuff came along, he wasn't prepared to hold that. And these people, you know, he would try anything. And so it, it, it got a hold of him. Like, my God, if he didn't drink, uh, my heroes drank. So when I was here, I was already drinking when I was like 13 or 14, somewhere, country club, crap. But uh, in this business you're in, man, right after you finish that show, you, you're like a play. You're up, you want to come down. And so by coming down, you go drink, and raise a little hell maybe a little bit more than I should have but uh, but it's a way of leveling out you know and when this crap came along Sam never could come down you know on top of the drinking well, believe me we all worried about it that was the reason I left I couldn't you know when he was drinking at least he was sober in the morning you know cocaine does cocaine's a ugh, disgusting drug that's when, that's when I lost the ability to, to make excuses for him because it also made him angry, it made him, you know, unpleasant. It, I found no reason to stay, you know. Especially as I saw him destroying himself, you know, and, and I could do nothing about it. I was very unhappy when he passed away because uh, I had lost a good friend, I felt, you know, even though he had told me to get the hell out of his office one time, but I didn't hold that against him because inside you knew that he had been hurt so bad, you know? He was a seeker of the truth. Uh, not all producers want the truth. Not all uh, studios or filmmakers want the truth. Sam was looking for the truth. And he couldn't find it on paper. He couldn't find it anywhere except when it was actually happening. 
And that's what he made, that's what he manifested. He manifested the truth of the moment. And it scared them. It scared them because they didn't know how to, uh, you know, they couldn't say, well, I don't like that take. But he put pictures together when he was allowed to that were uh, extraordinary. So his films will live forever, I'm sure, because, well, you know, he, he thought, and he knew, and he felt, and he, he got what he wanted, you know, by, by just doing, and with screaming and hollering and everything else that he had with producers who all they can see is dollar signs, you know, when they're shooting a picture. And that's why I loved him, because he was a great storyteller, especially with the camera. And uh, I miss all, all those guys. Sam seemed headed in that direction. It was, it was tremendously sad, was all, because I know that nobody was going to put their heart and soul into a film. Nobody that I knew, like Sam did, and they'll never be his like again I, that I can think of. I can't think of anybody who would risk everything for his work, you know. All my guts, all my life, everything I am is up on that screen. It's, it's all there. It's right there. Everything I feel, everything I am is there.